My busiest time, and it, it depends on what we're trying to do. Yes, Helen. Oh, you're just going to get some exercise, you sweet thing. Thank you, little girl. The, there are basically uh, some peak times. Uh, basically, late spring, uh, early summer is uh, when we're getting all the babies. And this is what we're right in the middle of right now. We get all the, all the, the, the small songbirds. I get all the orphaned raptors. We get the, orf the little orphaned mammals. And, and so this time of year is, is certainly really, really busy with orphans. And in the um, fall is when we get uh, a lot of the migrants. And, that, and the migrants usually consist of younger, there you go, younger birds of prey that are on their first migration that aren't caring for themselves well and they start starving to death. And, and so we go from, from the, the, the babies or orphans to to what I call the non-survivor orphans, which are the ones that haven't learned to feed themselves well enough, but they're completely on their own. And and so it pretty well takes us uh, from about uh, about April, you know, all the way through uh, uh, September, and and then uh, and and then on top of that, we have all of our. Uh, through the, the fall and winter, we have all of our wildlife programs, all the school programs and scout programs, and uh, yeah, a little feather floating around from, from Helen. And, and so it really is never not busy. You know, when you say birds, there, there certainly are a lot of different kinds of birds with very, very different needs. And so not one method works really for everybody or actually, you know, for just small groups. And so the, the care that this peregrine falcon needs is actually very, very different than the care that a golden or bald eagle need. And yet they're both birds, apex predators, they're both birds of prey. And, and, the, and the, the care that, the, that a, a robin or a sparrow or a starling or something like that needs is Again, very, very different. Hummingbirds are very, very different. Uh, and so you really have to uh, have a good, good sense of what the bird is uh, in order to understand what its needs are. Uh, and uh, with, without that good sense, uh, you're pretty much lost. If you try to, to, to feed this peregrine falcon parakeet seed, it's gonna die. Uh, and if you feed a parakeet, uh, you know, pigeon breast, it's going to die. So you just need to, to understand what kind of bird, just bird is, is too much of a generic term. You, d you, divide, you divide animals into, into two major groups, and that is, uh, what, is or what is considered native wildlife and exotics. That's the two big groups, and in the in those two big groups, it breaks down to much much smaller groups and many many smaller groups. I mean, if you're talking about um, uh, exotics, um, you know, a parakeet is an exotic, uh, a peacock is an exotic, a uh, domestically raised turkey is an exotic. And things things that are basically raised by humans in an environment that that is not their normal habitat. Those are considered exotics, and what's considered wildlife are are animals that are are raised in the wild uh, in their natural habitat, and and so my organization we do not do exotics, we do not do domestics, and domestics are exotics, but they're the difference between exotic and domestic is you you think of a macaw as an exotic and a pigeon as a, or a chicken as a domestic, but they're both raised in captivity by humans, and so they all come under the exotic category. So you got you have exotic, uh, and then exotic domestics, and so if someone were to bring me something that is not a native wildlife by federal law. I'm not allowed to rescue it. And the reason I'm not allowed to rescue it is because my job is to rescue and return back to the wild. And, and if I cannot return them back to the wild and it's illegal to release non-native wildlife back to the wild. And so I, I, can't, I can't rescue them and release them. So I, I, I don't, don't rescue them at all. Uh, now there are 
uh, there are organizations that do all kinds of uh, domestics, you know, horses, puppies, kittens, um, even even some uh, even domestic parrots and those kinds of things, and that's wonderful. And they don't need us; they don't need federal permits or state permits to do that. Where I have uh, a huge amount of state and federal permits in order to take care of wildlife like like this peregrine here, and so and so I dedicate my time to this at, where there aren't very many people uh, with the necessary licenses and permits to do this. And so I, I, I do have to be a little bit selective. Now, now one question was about the ringneck dove. Well, the Asiatic ringneck dove is basically, it's an exotic. It is not native wildlife. Uh, they were brought into the United States in the pet trade for um, uh, ornamental birds in aviaries in people's homes and those kinds of things. And they're beautiful and they're wonderful for that. Uh, it's the same kind of birds that magicians use for their magic act. Oh, but they use the white ones and not not the cream colored ones and, and so they're they're very very gentle very sweet very tame and if somebody wants to keep one of those for a pet that's wonderful you you know you can buy them at a at a, at a pet store um so i don't rescue those for the simple fact that they are not native wildlife and and, and they cannot be just released back to the wild uh, legally, and so people call me all the time because of the the ringneck dove uh, infestation that we have. And they says, "Well, we got this dove. You know, will you take care of it?" And, and I tell them up front, "It says, you know, de depends on the kind of dove. If it's a morning dove, Inca dove, or one of the other native doves, absolutely, we will take care of it. We'll try to heal it up and we'll return it back to the wild. But if it's a ringneck dove, I won't." Because, like I said, I only have limited resources. It's illegal to put them back in the wild. And if I were to take every ringneck dove and I can't release them uh, and kept them, I'd, I'd have thousands of ringneck doves in cages and they'd eat me out of house and home. Well, it's because they are, are not native and because they they really breed really well and they and and they are now considered an invasive species which means they're taking over the nesting sites for native birds and so there are lots and lots of ringneck doves all over north america now that are squeezing out some of the more sensitive uh native species uh the same thing goes with the english house sparrow the same thing goes with the starling these are all brought over originally as pets and so anytime we introduce an animal into an ecosystem uh, look at the problems in Florida with large um, boa constrictors and pythons. You know, they're not native, but wow, that's great habitat for them. And, and they are just destroying the ecosystem in the Everglades uh, throughout that area because they don't belong and, and, they're, and they're taking over the environment and squeezing out native wildlife. The, the animals that I work with are primarily apex predators. These are, you know, like, like uh, little Helen here, she is not a vegetarian. She is an apex predator and in the wild, her entire life revolves around uh, hunting and killing. And it's, and she, they do serve a very important job. Um, something I, I try to get across to people is, is we wouldn't have, uh, strong, healthy bird flocks. Here you go, sweetie. She needed to poop. Um, that's why I have towels on the floor. Without the apex predators. Now, the, the peregrine falcon likes to hunt other, they hunt exclusively other birds, or almost exclusively, not 100%, but almost exclusively. And because of that, um, they help to keep the flocks of songbirds healthy because her job is, is to cull out of the flocks of migratory songbirds the weak and the sick and the dumb and so it's it's very important to have these guys here to keep disease out of the flocks keep genetic uh uh adaptations that are that are inferior out of the flocks and so so that um our songbirds are are good and healthy so this is this is the oh i'm sorry did i frighten you sweetie i'm sorry yeah i know you got poor vision sometimes you get nervous Where's my girl? And, and so that's, that's kind of the whole point. Um, you know, within nature, there's a very, very delicate check and balance system. 
And these are, are very, very important parts of that whole system. Uh, so I, ca I can't feed her fruits and vegetables. I, I just can't. I can't feed her seed. I can't give her a bowl full of, of corn. I can't, you can't do that. They would not survive. They have to have animals. Um, and since she eats a lot of birds, she gets a lot of birds uh, in her natural diet. Uh, with us here, we order in uh, thousands uh, of Caternix quail. Now, Caternix quail are domestically raised of the same kind of quail that you buy at the grocery store. The difference is in the grocery store, they have them, they're plucked and they're butchered and they're clean and all that stuff. And with her, she doesn't get that. She, they, they have all the feathers and, and all of the intestines and body parts and everything. And they need that for a complete diet. Yes, you're being active, aren't you, sweetheart? Uh, for a complete diet, uh, and so she gets fed other birds, and she gets fed, you know, mice and, and those kinds of things as well, uh, and it's it's extremely important. So yes, uh, in in order for for a falcon like this, or a hawk, or an eagle, or an owl, or whatever to survive, you do have to sacrifice, you know, small small mammals, rodents, and and small to medium sized other birds. That's that's just the way this planet is set up. Well, uh, with with Helen here, because her eyesight's very very poor, she we can't allow her to fly and to hunt and those kinds of things. She first of all, she'd never see anything to hunt, and she'd fly into buildings because she can't see. Uh, she's not completely blind, but she has very very poor vision, and, and so. Her life is relatively boring in that, you know, she, uh, we do like to bring her upstairs here and hang out in front of the television because she likes to watch the TV. And I don't know that she can actually see the pictures, but she can see the color and the movement and that's kind of entertaining to her. And, and then she c comes outside and in, in her chambers and she can watch people walking up and down the street. She can watch, uh, you know, traffic and animals and, and those kinds of things, but she, she cannot be exercised and active like um, like the wild ones or or like my uh, my hunting birds like my my golden eagle or my Harris hawk they they fly free and they're in the wild and they get to go hunting and and do everything a wild bird does and and yet still have them as a wildlife ambassador for programs so they get to get, kind of do both but in her situation unfortunately they, we just can't do that with her Anytime you come across wild anything, and we, we're going to use birds for, for an example, wild birds, and I don't care if it's uh, uh, a, a little robin that has fallen from its nest or it's, or it's an, uh, an injured eagle that was hit by a car, the first thing you do is don't pick it up. That's rule number one. You don't pick it up. You observe the animal and you basically get as much information as you can as to your location if you if you have a gps gps coordinates are helpful um if you're on the highway and you can see a mile marker get the mile marker is it on the right hand side of the, of the road the left hand side of the road uh any any identifying marks um if a, if the house with a blue roof uh and it's 200 yards to the west of that if you can get good information that helps a lot and and then get on the phone and call someone that could help um even if it's a little robin and the reason for that is the vast majority of times people are picking up these animals when they actually don't need help and so let's go go with a small songbird like a robin to start with you got a little robin it's running around your backyard running around the the, the city park or under a under a nice uh, group of trees or whatever Birds outgrow the nest. This is normal. Uh, birds up, end up on the ground below the nest. Completely normal. As long as they're not in a life-threatening situation, like in the middle of a road or in a parking lot or where they're going to get killed, uh, we leave them there uh, because mom and dad will continue to come and feed and care for them because it's normal for them to come out of the nest before they can fly. This is all. In fact, right now, this time of year, you know, I have got robins and I have got... Uh, goldfinches and I've got sparrows and I've got everything running around my yard. 
under the lilac bushes and everything. In fact, when I mow the lawn, I have to be very careful not to run over all these babies that are running around the yard. Uh, so, so they're just kind of everywhere right now. Mom and dad are, are feeding them and caring for them, and it's wonderful. Now, if it isn't a life-threatening situation, then, it, then you can, especially if it's a small songbird, you can move it off to a safe location close to where it was and then call someone to get a little bit of advice. Now, that's, that's for the little songbirds, um, the, the, the stuff that's not going to hurt you. Now, when it comes to apex predators, like, like our little peregrine here, I'm pretty girl. If it comes to apex predators, these can be dangerous to work with, especially something the size of an eagle. And, and so if it's a, a, a large predatory bird, if it's an owl, if it's a, a hawk or a falcon or an eagle, by all means, please don't try to pick it up yourself. Uh, the talons are absolutely razor sharp and they can injure you. Uh, and one of the hardest things that people don't understand is, you know, even this falcon, even though its talons are not nearly as big and powerful as an eagle, those will puncture all the way through your hand. And so you get, you, they get this puncture right into your hand, and these basically puncture into the bowels of the animals they feed on. And so they're, these talons are covered with really, really nasty bacteria. And so you get a puncture wound from a bird of prey like this, and you can get an infection that literally could cause severe injury or, or even death with some of the bacterias that can get into, into your system from these talons. And so please, please don't try to pick them up. Um, call, call your local police dispatch. Don't call 911. 911 is for human emergencies. They get mad at you. But you can call police dispatch. You can call your local wildlife rescue center. You can call your local game warden uh, uh, to, get, to get someone that has the, the skills and expertise to handle these animals. Well, it, sometimes, it quite often is. It quite often, it depends on how long they've had it. Uh, it you know, if, if I get a phone call and the, the bird has only been away from the nest site uh, for an hour, you know, let's get it back, hurry up and, and put, it, put it back. And if it's, again, if it's mostly feathered and, and it's it just, just a fledgling out of the nest, you put it back, leave the area, it'll be fine. Mom and dad will care for it. Now, if it is, um, if it's been in human captivity, you know, overnight or for two or three days, uh, then the odds are we're not going to be able to put it back and that we're, we are going to have to finish raising it ourselves and get it reintroduced to the wild. And, and the truth is mom and dad could do a better job than I can. You know, I certainly rescue a lot, but um, there's just no substitution for, for, the, for what mom and dad can do for them. Yes, it, imprinting basically means that the, the bird was taken at, at, at a young age and it recognizes humans as its as its siblings, as its parents, uh, and that could be a really, really bad thing. You know, uh, an apex predator like this, if you take an apex predator that's been imprinted on humans and you put it in the wild, um, they have no fear about about seeking out civilization and hunting around civilization because that has been. Uh, where they know that they have been able to get food. Uh, and so you'll get, uh, and, and, and a lot of birds, uh, a good example are ravens. Ravens are kind of a feathered raccoon. Uh, a lot of people, you know, ravens are easy to raise and they'll raise them as a pet. And when they raise them as a pet, they get tired of it because they're very, very messy. And, and I get phone calls every year, usually around September, that there's a raven running around the neighborhood uh, just causing havoc because it was raised by somebody, released, sought out civilization, and, and the raven is going up and down the street, having a wonderful time on people's cars, taking the rubber off the windshield wipers and just peeling them off. Or I had a, I had a raven that uh, went around to several uh, retail stores in Cedar City that was uh, pulling on the rubber seal around doors and windows and and doing damage. I've had ravens that uh, 
were were basically chasing children down the street um and you know and obviously these birds are are you know going to get themselves killed and and so anytime you take a wild animal into captivity and you you possibly and you imprint them uh when they do have the opportunity to go back to the wild it, it that becomes a problem and so it's very, very, very important to realize that um, they they should only be handled uh, by licensed individuals with the the skills and equipment and education uh, to avoid imprinting. So to make sure they get appro the appropriate diet, so that they they grow to the right strength. I, I mean, the the ones that I have out out in our rescue facilities right now, they get almost no human contact because I do not want them to imprint on humans. Well, no, that's, that's kind of an exaggeration. But basically the way imprinting happens, the, the birds, oh, like this peregrine falcon right here, um, they imprint usually within 14 uh, to 21 days of age. So you get a young chick, it's in the nest, and, a, and about 14 to 21 days is when its, when its eyes focus well enough and its brain is developed to the point where now it basically sees what's going on and it sees, okay, you know, mama falcon brings me food, so that's my mama falcon. But if you're a human and you're bringing them food at that age and they say, okay, the, this guy is my mama falcon and, and, um, and these guys can be extremely belligerent to their parents. This is why you don't want to imprint them. Uh, you don't want to be a mama falcon because th they, that actually actually makes them more dangerous to work with. So uh, the ones that, that are full grown that I'm rescuing, uh, they never imprint. They're always wild, especially if if you have have as little contact as you possibly can with them. So minimum contact is is really the key. And, and avoid any contact during the, the time. And different kinds of birds imprint at different stages. I know uh, ducks and geese will imprint day one. Uh, these guys usually imprinted at two to three weeks. Uh, and so you, you want to you wanna skip that portion uh, of their life and, and have virtually no contact with them. Oh yeah, there, there's a be best of intentions. You know, the vast majority of people, um, they they think they're rescuing the animal, and and they they have absolutely the best of intentions. And I'll give you a great example. Um, we we have certainly uh, rescued and raised many many baby deer. Uh, the pr and of all the years, now I've been here in Utah for over forty years. All the deer that have been brought in, except one. One deer was actually, its mother was hit by a car and killed, and the baby was an orphan. Every other deer that has ever been brought into my rescue center was stolen from its mom. And the reason we know it was stolen from its mom is because deer hide their fawns. Deer uh, will hide their fawns in hay fields. They'll hide their fawns in, in high brush. They'll hide them, the fawns under uh, a log pile or something along those lines. And mom will only come and feed the baby in the early morning and late evenings. Otherwise, the baby just hides very, very quietly in their little place. And mom does not come anywhere near them because she doesn't want to attract predators to her baby. Now, you go hiking along the uh, up in the mountains or along the foothills, and you come across this brush patch, and you say, oh, look, there's a baby deer, and mommy's nowhere to be found. Oh, poor thing, it's abandoned. We need to rescue it. And they pick up the baby deer and they take it home. And then with the best of intentions, what do you feed babies? Will you feed them milk? No, you don't. Cow's milk is extremely difficult for them to digest. It gives them the scours, they dehydrate, and they die from milk. You can't feed them milk. They have to have mother's milk. They have to have the kind of milk that a mama deer does. Now there are some milk supplements that we can that we can use, but mother but mother deer milk is the best thing for the babies you could possibly give them and, and so these baby deer people take them they take them home 
they have them for three or four days the children are just loving on this deer it's just the cutest thing you ever saw and now the deer has got scours and which is diarrhea and it's it's going everywhere and it's getting weaker and it won't stop crying and it's getting weaker and then people call me up and says hey we've got this baby deer that we rescued and there's something really wrong with it and then they they then basically i go down and get it or they bring it to me whichever the case may be and and then it truly is a life or death um their digestive system cannot handle cow's milk and they're dying and and there's a lot of a lot of work and a lot of medication a lot of around the clock feedings and and um you know we've been able to save most of them that have come in that way but there's some that we just couldn't save because people with very good intentions they just stole a baby deer from its mom you know do i have any advice uh using the internet youtube those kinds of things uh, to get information about caring for baby animals, baby birds, all, all of that kind of stuff. Yes, rule number one, don't believe anything that you see on the internet. That is absolute rule number one. You do, you do need to go to a source. And the best source is a local wildlife rehabber or uh, your local state fish and game. Um, if you have a, a, a university that, that has a, a, a good biology department and deals with, with mammals and birds and, and those kinds of things, that could be a good resource. Um, if you can't get any of those things, uh, you, yes, if, if that's all you've got is YouTube, uh, you know, be, just be, be very, very careful and, and, uh, and try to find um anyone that's giving you the advice uh if they are not state and federally licensed as a as a wildlife rehabilitator um they may give you good advice but uh, more often than not they're probably just giving you personal advice and not experience and and that can certainly cause you know death to the animals uh, and even injuries to yourself. So, so please do not rely on the internet as as your as your, a major source of information when it comes to caring for sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife. Um, you know, find find as close to an expert as you possibly can. the The whole point is, if they are not a a state and federally both state and federally licensed wildlife rescue facility that then i would certainly um take any any suggestions that they have um that's my girl she gives me about a second notice that she's going to poop um I, I i would take that that information very cautiously be, because uh there's lots and lots of people that say oh yeah i i raised a cottontail rabbit and this is what I fed them, and you, and I'm going, oh my gosh, you know, you couldn't have you couldn't have fed them worse, and and why it lived, I don't know, you, you know, just a little bit of dumb luck, and and to be honest with you, a lot of these people will will raise these animals and just keep them as pets and imprint them, have them run around their house and play with their kids and, until until they become full grown and they become dangerous and then they dump them back in the wild but they don't talk about that on their YouTube uh, videos and I'll be honest with you a lot of people you know question the processes that I use when I do my wildlife rescue here's the bottom line guys uh, when you see a uh, you know 10 15 20 minute YouTube video that is not a wildlife rescue that's just a small tiny piece of a wildlife rescue and there's a lot of stuff that we just don't have time to video that we're doing especially when these animals come in you know so close to death and it's an emergency situation the last thing i'm thinking about is setting up the camera make sure we got good lighting and give you good content that's the last thing i want to do uh, i am focused on getting the animal getting it cared for and, and then 
when things are a little bit settled down, we, we might kind of go back and say, okay, here's here we're feeding, here we're you know putting a two feeder in, here we're doing that or the other thing. But but um, you're not seeing the whole the whole story, and and that's true on anything that you see on on YouTube. In fact, that's you, you even National Geographic's any even some of these you know hour long documentaries and those kinds of things. They're they're telling you a story. They're giving you some really really fundamentals. But you cannot learn how to, how to care for these kinds of animals uh, off the internet. It's just not possible. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. You know the here here's uh, again the point. You cannot learn how to handle these animals from videos. You really have to work with someone who is skilled, who is qualified, who is educated, and, and, and basically apprentice under them so, so that they can walk you through. I mean, anything that, I mean, it sounds so simple to go, you know, pick up the bird from a perch, but if you do it wrong, it upsets the bird. And, and so there are techniques that we use to pick them up. There are techniques that we use to set them down there. And, you know, I, I, I have brand new falconers who have, just started their apprenticeship you know they come up to me and says you know every, every time i do this the bird bites my finger and i says don't do that it it is these are not pets these are wild animals and you and you have to respect that and and this is why uh by f both state and federal law you have to go through uh the appropriate training and licensing procedures you cannot just go and and get one of these animals. I know in other countries you can. Uh, you know, uh, I've had other people call me up and say, you know, I've just uh, ordered um, uh, a, a bird of prey, uh, and it's going to come in next week, and I don't know anything about them. Um, you know, can you can you tell me what to do? And it's like you you're like four thousand miles away from me. Um, I don't think you could afford the phone bill to call me three or four times a week so that I can walk you through the process. You, you need to find someone in your own country that can uh, take you under their wing, so to speak, and teach you all, all of the skills and techniques that you need to work with these animals. Uh, I'm very happy to answer questions. And so if there's something I can help you with, I'm happy to do it. But but. I, I can't have a student um, from Germany or Ireland or Scotland or wherever. I, I can't have a student there because because I can't do them justice. Really not. Um, you, you know the the truth of the matter is we're let's it, let's let's use um, someone that's got a lot of years with citizens with with large parrots, and that's wonderful. And and that's that's a really wonderful skill set, but that does not. You gonna go for a minute, now, sweetie? That 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 doesn't um, prepare you to handle an apex predator carnivore type bird. That's a you know the the techniques, of the personalities, the diets, the requirements are extremely different than that. And, and so you you know you have to. And, and this is why you have to have, be federally licensed. You have to, in order to do this, you have to go through a two-year training program with a qualified licensed individual before you can even start to work with these animals because they're not parrots and they're not chickens. That does not prepare you to work with, with wildlife. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, I don't qualify... I, I would not qualify to work with hummingbirds with the knowledge that I have about eagles. But fortunately, I've worked, we've worked with a lot of hummingbirds. We've had a lot of success with little tiny hummingbirds, but the techniques that we use on hummingbirds is extremely different. It's, it's, it's a completely different kind of an animal. And so I, I would never, I, I, I could never transpose my eagle knowledge to, to hummingbirds. And 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 people who do game birds, pheasants, and and chucker and quail and that kind of stuff, 
very, very different than, let's say, waterfowl. And so each kind of group of birds really uh, requires their own special niche. And it's the same with mammals. Just because uh, you've raised uh, a dog doesn't qualify you to, to handle coyotes and wolves. It really doesn't. Uh, different kinds of animals, the difference between domestics and, and, and wildlife, uh, just because you've had a house cat doesn't mean that you should own a Siberian tiger. I mean, that that's, would just be ridiculous. Or even a bobcat or a cougar. Uh, and so even someone who is well-versed in, let's say, working with uh, cougars uh, really uh, is not qualified to to work with a bobcat. Bobcats are different. And they and it would be a good idea is that if you were used to working with cougars and you come up with, and you come up with a bobcat that you need to work with, to have somebody that has specialized in working with bobcats to to help you get through that process so that you don't make the mistakes because the animals are very different. Even this peregrine falcon right here, um, you know, she's a beautiful animal, but she's not a golden eagle. She's not a Harris hawk. She's not a prairie falcon. She's not a red-tailed hawk. She's a peregrine. And, and they do require very specific processes and foods and facilities and techniques that, that the other ones require differently. So, so there, there is no crossover. Uh, any kind of a wild animal that is acting tame. Uh, wild is wild and they, they are afraid of humans. They stay away from humans. And so if you've got a wild animal that walks up to you and, and is acting tame, there's something desperately wrong. Now, whether it's imprinted, whether it's starving, whether it's diseased, whether it's poisoned, I don't know. There's so many possibilities. But anytime a wild animal acts tame, and that, and that is not just birds, that's you know, deer, coyotes, foxes, wolves, bears, I don't care what animal you come up with. If it's a wild animal and it's acting tame, there's something desperately wrong. And keep your distance and call the appropriate uh, people to, to assess the situation. And it may be nothing more than, you know, somebody raises a pet and it's just acclimated to humans. And that's dangerous in itself. But uh, don't ever assume that an animal, that a wild animal that's acting tame is tame. And obviously, if it's, you know, laying off the side of the road and, and barely breathing, obviously the intervention is needed. If it's, uh, you know, if, if there's uh, an obvious physical injury, then obviously some intervention needs to be done. But um, probably the, the thing that most people don't understand, and, and I get this all the time people come up to me and says, well, you know, I, I found this, this wild animal and it loves me. And it's just, it was so sweet and it was so gentle and it was so tame and it just loved, loved me to death. And it was asking me to save its life. And so I took it home and it, but it died anyway. And I felt really bad, but at least it died, it died knowing that someone loved it and someone was going to help it. And, and I, I just, I don't have the heart to tell them I'm really, really sorry, but if you would have called in someone who, who is an expert in the subject, they might have been able to save its life. And, th and that the animal wasn't being loving and gentle. The animal was, was very, very ill. That's why it acted tame. People will call me up, and, and then you have to kind of be a little bit suspicious. You know, I've got this baby owl that has fallen from the nest, and... And, uh, you know, what do I need to do to be able to keep it? And then you're, then you automatically, you was, you're a little bit suspicious. Did they, did they find the baby owl or did they steal the baby owl or did they find the peregrine? Or did they steal the peregrine? You, you know, um, here's, here's the deal. Um, without the proper state and federal permits, you can't even have a feather for one of these animals, period. And in order to get the, the state and federal per permits, um, to have a bird like this, you have to go through a two-year training program. And so you cannot just go get one and then say, oh, I really like this animal and I'm going to keep it for a pet. And so what do I need to do to get licensed? Well, the minute that you say you've got this, it's confiscated. And, and 
even possibly you could be arrested. It's illegal. And if you want to have be a falconer, that's perfectly fine. You could be a falconer, but you have to go through the processes to become a licensed falconer or go through the process to become a licensed wildlife rehabilitator before you acquire the animals. Because not only do you have to go through a two-year training program, you have to pass a written test, you have to have all of your facilities inspected to make sure they have everything that you need to care for the animals properly. And so it's in the animal's best interest not to have someone that has no knowledge thinking that this is a cool pet, because this is not a cool pet. You know, these, these are wild animals, and it requires a great deal of, of knowledge and training to be able to deal with these guys uh, appropriately. And, you know, I, I tell people all the time, as difficult as it sounds like to become a falconer, it is far more difficult to be a falconer. And so if it's, if it's too much for you to do it legally, then you're certainly not going to do it right. And so if you have an interest in wildlife and you want to work with, with the wildlife, please take the time, get the education, um, get the proper licenses and permits, and, and, then, and then acquire, acquire the animals um, through a legal source. Don't just go out and steal one through a legal source. And, and you will be at that point far better qualified to give the animal what it needs uh, and you will enjoy the experience significantly more. Actually, veterinarians are not licensed to work on wildlife. Um, now, uh, like here in southern Utah, uh, I've, I've got some vets here in the southern Utah area. Uh, they cannot take in an injured falcon like this or eagle or those kinds of things. It, they, they can't do that. They're not licensed to do that. And so they have to work with a federally licensed wildlife rehabber that has the permits. And so basically, we, we, we team up. I have um, good veterinarians that help me, but, um, you know, they, 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 they can't care for wildlife without me. Does that make sense? And, and so um, they, they have the medical training and skills, and, and I, I certainly have most of that myself, but uh, I, I have the um, abilities to handle um, apex predators, threatened and endangered species, wildlife, uh, that, that they don't get that kind of training in, as, as they're going through their veterinary schooling. So, so it's, it's a specialty. Uh, there are a few vets that are licensed as, as wildlife rehabbers, but again, they have to, they had to go through all the training that I go through on top of being a veterinarian. The, the last few years, you know, with, with our YouTube channel, uh, you know, people have come, they've seen the work that we do, they're, they're getting some, some information uh, and they need more because, like I said, the, the videos that, that we post are, are not meant to teach you how to care for sick inter orphan wildlife. It's meant to show you that, that there are people out there that do have the skills and expertise to do so. And so we, none of my videos were ever meant as an educational video to teach you how to care for sick injured orphan wildlife. So please don't take it for that. But I do get phone calls uh, because the internet is international. I, I get phone calls from all over the world with people that um, in, their, in their country, there isn't a facility like ours that cares for these animals. And, and there are oftentimes that... Um, you know, that I'm trying to walk them through, you know, what they can do as amateurs when there's absolutely no other resources available. There's no veterinary care. There's no way that they can get anybody else to help them uh, to care for the animal to get it to the point where it's healthy can be released. Uh, it's, it's, to be honest, it's almost impossible to give somebody enough information over the telephone uh, to make them equipped and qualified to handle any kind of, of a wild animal. And it's even worse um, with emails and text messages.
Su Susan is one of my sub permittees with my wildlife rescue. And so she helps me with the big birds, um, but it's it's still all, all on, on my license. And to be honest with you, um, you know, she, she does not have, uh, she certainly has the knowledge and in a, and, and in a, um, in a desperate situation, she could certainly step in and help uh, and, and those kinds of things. But she is really not comfortable uh, dealing with, with these kinds of animals. Uh, so, you know, the, the way we make our living is we own a dog grooming shop. Now, Susan is, is a certified master dog groomer. That's wonderful. And she's really, really good with what she does with the dogs. Um, you know, Susan and I've been together for over 40 years. And, and I'll tell you what, I would never, ever try to give a dog a haircut. You know, and she wouldn't let me. I can promise you, she wouldn't let me do that. So, so basically, you know, we, we're very fortunate that that um, you know that she has enough skill to help me with the wildlife rescue, and I have just barely enough skill to help her with the dog grooming shop. But I, I certainly am not a qualified groomer. Well, it makes Susan ner nervous when I'm handling the eagles because she knows the da how dangerous they are. They know how much power they have in their feet. I mean, w one day I was I was holding my eagle, I was feeding my eagle, and I had and I had right right on my glove here I had a rabbit leg that was sitting here, and the eagle basically reached down to this rabbit leg and ripped a chunk uh, off the rabbit leg. Um, uh, oh, as as you know, a chunk you know bigger than these two fingers together, and just tore this huge mass massive chunk of flesh off the rabbit leg and swallowed it whole. And when Susan saw that, she thought, oh my God, um, that eagle could rip your nose off. And I'm going, yeah. And, and, and so, you know, that kind of a reality check just basically um, uh, drove home the point that, that these are wild animals and they can be dangerous. And you really have to to, to, to understand the animal, uh, never, ever, ever take them for granted, never assume anything, uh, and, and take all the appropriate precautions. Um, they would have to work with me for, as, as, and in fact, they would, legally, they'd have to work with me for at least a couple of years. Uh, but before I would trust them to, to actually, without supervision, um, feed baby birds without supervision, it, it, they would have to go through a, a year to, to make sure that they understand the, the amount of food and, and the proper techniques uh, to get the food into their mouths without choking them and, and uh, you know, using uh, feeding tubes and whatever else equipment that, that needs to be done. There's, it's a little bit, there's a little finesse, a little technique. And so I, I would not trust anyone without a, at least a year uh, of, 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 complete supervision before I would say, uh, you know, go, go ahead and we've got three rob baby robins, go feed them. I would, that, that'd be a year away. Well, again, they would have to at least a couple of years uh, and they, they would have to show uh, the, um, the, the, the proper, yes, you're such a pretty girl, the proper, um, attitudes and, and, and stuff to do that. It's yeah, you can, I'm a chair there, sweetie. There we go. You didn't give me my two seconds. There you go. The they they would have to sh show the that they have the uh, kind of the right temperament uh, in order to do that. Um, there are an awful lot of people who have wanted to work with, with raptors that just that just didn't have the personality for it. And and they get um, they get a little bit frustrated and and the problem is that if you start getting a little bit nervous or, or upset they 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 see that in you and they start getting a little nervous and upset and it and the process escalates from there and and so you have to have a a high degree of confidence uh, in in what you're doing and and the the right kind of a of a temperament where you have the confidence but you're not aggressive. 
And so I can move in very quickly and pick up these birds without the birds feeling that I'm being overly aggressive to them. Different with the wildlife ambassadors, you know, they get their time. We, we spend time together um, and, and we, we, we socialize with them. You know, Helen here, you know, she, she sleeps in the house. She's part of the family. She goes out uh, and visits with people. And we, we try to keep her really, it's the, the process is called Manny. We try to keep her very well manned so that, that um, civilization doesn't upset her. Now the wild ones that we rescue get none of that because we don't want them acclimated to people. And so they get no socialization. They're the, in fact, I'll be really honest with you. The ones that I rescue, they hate me because I'm the one that uh, rescues them. I'm the one that sticks a feeding tube down their throat. I'm the one that puts an IV, takes out the IV, puts in stitches, takes out stitches. I am, I'm the one that does the physical therapy. When they're ready to go back to the wild, boy, they hate me and they want to leave as quickly as they can. And that's a really good thing because if it's kind of a bad experience uh, being around humans, then they stay further away from humans. And that's what we want. It, that's one of those things. He's an eagle. He's powerful. He can be extremely dangerous. And a, a person would have to show me that they have the, the proper not only knowledge uh, and skills, but the, but the, uh, the correct aptitude. Um, it would really thoroughly be up to Scout. If, if Scout won't tolerate them, then they don't handle Scout. Um, and, and so that's, you know, just, just strictly up to, to him as to it, whether anybody else handles him or not. Again, Scout was completely wild, and, and I had to go through the process to acclimate him to me, and and it's it's a very long process uh, of building a relationship and building trust, and and Scout is now a, a very very dear friend of mine. Now that's not why he comes back, not because he's a friend. He comes back because he exploits me, and I understand that, and that's just fine. But you know he is he is a dear friend, and we have a a, a really uh, wonderful relationship between the two of us, and we appreciate that. Um, and and you know if there was um, an individual who was willing to put in the years to develop that kind of a friendship, that's what I'm talking about having the the correct aptitude and patience and skills. Um, and uh, and if and if uh, when you're dealing with an animal that big and that powerful, if you make a mistake, you're going to the hospital. And, and so we we have to have people that, with the right aptitudes and personalities to handle that kind of stuff. You know, when I have my my uh, my Harris Hawk Bell and and we go out hunting together and I give people gloves to wear and they walk along with us and Bell fly and land on their glove uh, and 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 hunt with them as well as hunt with me. Um, ba basically, what we're doing there is first of all the Harris Hawk is, has a very very stable disposition uh, and is not nearly as dangerous as like a golden eagle, but al also they uh, they hunt in groups, which is a unique behavior and so human the humans become her group now now she is never go, never meant to go into the wild she is strictly a wildlife ambassador and a falconry bird and so we can do things with her that we don't do with the wild ones and, and so with a little bit of instruction you know basically tell people when they when they hear her bells ringing hold your hold your glove up and she'll land on your glove and then lower the glove down to to about the position i've got helen here and then just keep walking don't try to pet her. Just you know, just enjoy the moment with a, with this hawk on your glove as we're walking out through the desert. Um, you know, if you try to touch her, you will offend her, and she will not come back to you ever again. But it, but if you if you're a if she can exploit you, if you're a good perch, uh, and and you you make her hunting a little more successful, uh, then then she doesn't mind mind you. Um, that's a little bit different than than the 
the ones that I rescue. Now, when you see me um, releasing, you know, a big uh, hawk or eagle or falcon back into the wild, and I put the the eagle in someone's arms, let them release it. Um, the the animal is only in their arms for just uh, uh, just a very few minutes, and I give them a fairly extensive, you know, explanation as to exactly what they're going to do and and the and the right way to be safe, and and um, and then the the minute the animal starts to struggle, they chuck it so so it goes and flies free. But what what we're doing there is we we are given people a uh, kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity to release them. But again, this is not a bird that's going to fly away and come back. These birds are just leaving. And that's, and that's the, what they're supposed to do. And please, please let me make this very clear guys. If there is an animal emergency, if you have an animal that's sick and dying, please, please, Pick up the phone and dial the phone. Try to talk to somebody that has the skills and expertise to help you, whether you call, you know, me or or I would, you know, it, whatever state you're in, I would prefer that you call someone closer to you that can actually assist you. But try to talk to somebody. Do, do not send them a text. Do not send them an email because I get emails all the time and I, I check my emails uh, and here's an email that came in at, at uh, six o'clock in the morning, and it's now eight o'clock at night, and I finally get around to look at my emails. And please help, help! I'm desperate. This animal's dying. Please help me! And I'm going, oh my god! I know by the time I am able to email them back to find out what's going on, the animal's dead. So please, a little common sense. If it is an emergency, please use the telephone. Emails and texts is inappropriate in a life-threatening situation. You know, I would never, never, if I saw a tragic car accident, I would never, never email the, the, the EMTs. I would never email the police department. I would, you get on the phone where you can actually help and you can talk to somebody and you can give them the information and you can get help to them much, much quicker. So please, let's stop this email and text stuff if it is an emergency, use the telephone.